story of how God was seeking a bride for his son. Each book is different from every other book. I'm trying to give you the keys for you to unlock it for yourself. When people try to read the Bible through from cover to cover, they usually get stuck in one of two places. They either get stuck in Leviticus, that's a favourite stopping off point when you're reading through the Bible, because suddenly all the stories stop and it's just law and ritual and things that seem a little irrelevant. The other place where people get stuck is in Chronicles. And when we read the Bible right through in our church non-stop, there were two or three poor people who had to read the first nine chapters of Chronicles, which if you know them, are nothing more than genealogies, family trees, just name after name after name, most of them quite unpronounceable to the English tongue. And the poor people read for 15 minutes nothing but old Hebrew names and all the begatting. It seems as if they did nothing much but begat in those days. And so-and-so begat so-and-so and so-and-so begat so-and-so. And it just goes on and on for nine whole chapters. And then when you get through that, you're into what looks like a repeat performance because you've just been reading through one and two kings and now you're reading the whole story all over again. It's, and it puzzles many people, why do we have two accounts of the same period of history? The Kingdom of Israel. You get it first in kings and then exactly the same thing. And the same kings and the same events in chronicles. Why? And we've got to begin our study of chronicles by asking that question. Now one of the difficulties we English have is the order of books in the English Bible, which is quite different from the order of books in the Jewish Bible. And I want to try and explain this with this chart. The Hebrew Old Testament is in the order of the first column and the second down to there. And the English order of books in the Old Testament is here and here. And we notice a number of things. First of all, they are grouped quite differently. There are three groups of books in the Hebrew Bible, which they call the Law, the Prophets, and the Writings. And if you remember the story of Jesus on the road to Emmaus with the two disciples after his resurrection, it says he took them through the Scriptures and showed them everything in the Law, the Prophets, and the Writings concerning himself. That was his Bible. That was the grouping. And you notice some real changes. First of all, the first five books of the Bible are all separated from the rest. They are the law, or the Torah, which means maker's instructions. And the Torah, or the Pentateuch it sometimes calls, Penta means five, and so the five books of the law, what we call Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, they actually call by the first words on each scroll. So Genesis is called in the beginning, Exodus is called these are the names, Leviticus is called anti-called, and Numbers is called in the wilderness, and Deuteronomy is called these are the words. But that's just because they're the first words, and they just unroll the scroll and see the first words, they know which one they've got. Then immediately they go into prophets, and they have two subgroups of prophets. They call Joshua, Judges, Samuel and Kings, and Samuel is only one book in the Hebrew Old Testament, Kings is only one book, the reason being that when they only used consonants and not vowels, it only took up half the space. So of course when these were turned into first Greek and then English, they took up so much more space, it was divided into two books because the vowels doubled the length of words. That's the only reason. But these four books, they call them former prophets. Now, I tried to explain when we did Samuel and Kings that they're not history, they are prophetic insight into history. And Samuel was this prophet who dominated that earlier period and during the period of the kings there were dozens of prophets and it was the prophets who wrote the history in many cases and who interpreted it and showed them what God was doing. And then they put the later prophets, the latter prophets, into another group and that's how we do it as well. Uh, the colouring seems to have gone a bit astray there, but anyway, forget that. Then we have the writings, and this is a kind of miscellaneous box in which everything else goes. And the Psalms are in there, though they call that book praises. 
They don't call it Psalms, they call it praises. Book of Job is in there, book of Proverbs. Ruth comes right out of here and down to here. It is not considered a prophetic book, so it goes into the writings. And that's a big change from our Bible. Song of Songs comes in here, then Ecclesiastes comes in, but it's called the Preacher. And Lamentations comes in, but as I told you, that is simply called How, because that's the uh, first word in it. Esther and Daniel. Daniel is not put among the prophets, he's put in the writings. That's rather important to notice. Ezra and Nehemiah come in here. And finally, the last book in the Old Testament, in the Jewish Old Testament, is Chronicles. Only it's called simply the words of the days, a kind of record of history. In other words, the book of Kings is regarded in a totally different light to the book of Chronicles. One book is prophetic and the other's not. And we're going to see why in a moment. It means that the last word in the Old Testament in the Jewish Bible, or the Jewish Old Testament, is the word aliyah, which means go up. And the last word in Chronicles is let us go up, meaning let's go back to Jerusalem. And ever since, whenever Jews go back to the Promised Land, they say, I'm making aliyah. And aliyah means I'm going up to Jerusalem. See? And that's a much better arrangement than the English because the last word in English is curse. <laughs> and you know, the Jews will never read Malachi to the last verse in the synagogue because they will not finish with the word curse. I'll tell you what they do with it when we study Malachi. But uh, you see, the order's quite different. And in Luke 24, we find Jesus opening the Bible the way the Jew opened it showing them everything in the law, the prophets, and the writings concerning himself. Now in English, we have three quite different groupings. We call all the first books of the Bible history, and we treat Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy as history, and lump it in with Joshua and Judges as if it just carries on. And we put Ruth in there, because we think it's part of the history. And we put Samuel, Kings, and we put Chronicles immediately after Kings. And that's why we tend to get the impression it's just saying the same thing over again. Actually, it isn't. When we look closely, it's a totally different kind of book. And it's not a prophetic book. But I'm afraid when you put them next door to each other in our Bible, we just think, oh, I've read all that in Kings, so I'll skip Chronicles. And we miss the message. And then it adds Ezra and Nehemiah in the history, though here it's in the writings. And then we put Esther in there as the la last bit of history. And then we have a collection we call poetry, and we put in that Job, the drama of Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. That's what comes next. You can see we've completely changed the order. And then finally we get through to what we think is prophecy, and we don't divide them into former and latter, we divide them into major and minor. And say we've got four big ones and twelve little ones, and we put Daniel in there. Now you see, it means that I'm afraid we Gentiles have misunderstood a lot of things and we've got them in a quite different classification. And so we tend to treat Kings and Chronicles as the same kind of book. And certainly if you don't study them carefully, you could come to that conclusion. The result is that the books of Chronicles are very little known in church circles. So much so that I think there are only two verses that we ever quote out of the whole books. One is 2 Chronicles 7.14, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. I don't know how many times I've heard that quoted over the last 20 years. Have you? There was a whole musical called If My People based on that one verse. And yet the verse was taken right out of context. And it was made to apply to England as if I will heal their land applied to England. Or America, since the musical was written there. But the land there is the land of Israel. And there is nothing to allow us to apply it to any other land. But I'm afraid it makes a good motto, if you know what I mean. And it was lifted out of context and become one of the most popular texts of the last 20 years. It's dying down a bit now, but it really, everywhere you went, it was, if my people, if my people. 
The other one is from the reign of King Jehoshaphat when he was uh, attacked by three separate nations who were allied together and said, we're going to wipe out little Judah. And they marched on Jehoshaphat and he prayed and he sought the Lord and the prophet said, you're going to win the battle. But he was told to send singers ahead of the army into battle. It's a classic case. And so the singers, the choir, led the army into battle and sang praises to God and the enemy fled. And that is the other verse from Chronicles that really has been picked up. It's led to the Jesus marches. It's led to all kinds of things that if we lead with praise and send the choir out, we're going to beat the enemy. It's uh, the other verse. But both of these verses, frankly, have been taken right out of context. And uh, we've been singing the verse from Jehoshaphat's battle, the battle is the Lord's. The battle belongs to the Lord. We've sung a song already uh, today with that, or was it yesterday? And uh, apart from that, people just don't know Chronicles. It's rather sad. But uh, I want to show you that it's a book that has a message of its own and not just a book to pick an odd text out of, but really to get hold of. Its message is quite different from the books of Kings. There are other duplications in the Bible. There are two accounts of creation in Genesis, one from God's point of view, one from man's point of view. There are four accounts of Jesus in the New Testament and they are all complementary. There are things in the four Gospels that sound just the same but they're coming from a different angle because each Gospel was written for a different kind of person. And the same parable in two Gospels can have an entirely different mes message. The parable of the lost sheep in Luke's Gospel, which is written for unbelievers, the lost sheep is a sinner. But in Matthew, the same parable in a gospel that was written for believers is a backsliding church member. So even one story has a different meaning because it's in a different book. See? And therefore the same stories about David and Solomon and Jehoshaphat and Hezekiah in the Kings and Chronicles, the same story has an entirely different message. It's written from a different angle. So, we'll have to try and unravel the difference. And let me just remind you of things I've said earlier. All history has an angle. You can't write history without betraying your personal interest because you select from all that happened, you select the things you're interested in and that you think are important. And then, having given that selection, you then connect them up to show how one thing led to another. And then you evaluate, you explain or evaluate what you've written, meaning you then have to say whether what you've written about was a good thing to happen or a bad thing to happen. So a historian, step one, selection, step two, connection, step three, evaluation or explanation. And that's when you make a moral judgment. And if you know that old history book, 1066 and all that, those moral judgments are made all the way through. This was a bad thing. This was a good thing to happen for England. And in the same way, you find the moral judgment, the evaluation in Kings is quite different from the book of Chronicles. Just to give you a clue straight away, the book of Kings concentrates on all the bad things the Kings did, whereas the book of Chronicles concentrates on all the good things the Kings did. It's as simple as that. Well, let's spell this out a bit and just tease it out so that you've got it. You see, again, taking the New Testament, what it says about the Old, it says the Old Testament was written as examples for us so that we can learn from these things. So why in the book of Kings are we told about all the bad things that kings did and in the book of Chronicles we're told about all the good things they did? You get quite a different picture. They were all sinners in Kings and they're all saints in Chronicles. <laughs> Now, is this distorting history or what's happening? Why is there this difference of emphasis? Well, now let's draw the comparison between, uh, you can come up and look at this closer later and see the difference, but it is very striking when Kings and Chronicles are together in English Bibles but far apart in Jewish Bibles. Let's sort of uh, contrast. I've talked about the selection of uh, historical events and then their connection, so you explain how they link up, and then the evaluation that decides whether it was a good thing or a bad thing. 
But when we look at Samuel and Kings and Chronicles, we find first of all that Samuel and Kings between them, which were only two books in the Hebrew Testament, Old Testament, but are four books in ours, they cover a period of 500 years only. But when we come to Chronicles, we find it starts much earlier and it finishes later. Actually, that word is wrong, it should be later. It starts much earlier, it goes way back to Adam, right back through the centuries to the very beginning of the human race, and it finishes later, and it is this that is the key to the difference. Samuel and Kings finish in the exile, but here we have the return. Let us go up to Jerusalem is the last word in Chronicles. And therefore, these two writers had a, quite a different task in front of them and they met that need quite differently. Here, there had to be an explanation as to why everything had gone wrong. But they now knew all that. Now they had to be picked up again and encouraged and sent back to build it all up again. This was written quite soon after the events. Most of this was written long after the events. Here we have a political history for the most part, but here we have a concentrate, concentration on the religious history of the same period. This is from a prophetic viewpoint, but this is from a priestly viewpoint. This covers, of course, kings in the north and the south. But Chronicles, covering the same period, never mentions a single northern king. He is not interested in the north at all. That's a huge difference. Maybe you never spotted that. But above all, here he concentrates on the human failings of the kings that led to disaster. But here he wants to concentrate on the divine faithfulness. He's going to play down the royal vices and he's going to play up the royal virtues. Again, we'll see why when we uh, tease out the book. Therefore, this has a very negative view of the kings. This has a very positive view for a very real reason. It's not that he's trying to change history. It is a selection that's going on and while he selects all the bad things the kings did, he selects all the good things they did. Same kings, and they were a mixture of good and bad. Here, the emphasis is moral, and the key word is righteousness. Were these kings righteous or not? But here, there is an interest more in ritual again, in the temple and the sacrifices. And the interest is in spiritual rather than moral issues. And so we have here a prophet writing and here a priest writing. And the difference of viewpoint is enormous. Well, now those are some of the differences. And we must now ask, so what is happening? I think one of the best ways is to ask what Chronicles is leaving out that Kings and Samuel put in. Clearly, a great deal is because there's quite a different proportion of chapters to each king. For example, over there, in Samuel and Kings, Saul has about a sixth of the book. Here, hardly anything. Half, at least. Sorry, Samuel I'm talking about. No, I'm talking about Saul. David, here, is about two-thirds of what he has there. Solomon, about half. The divided kingdom, again, about half. So what's going on? What is he leaving out? Let's be specific. Number one, he leaves out entirely Samuel's part in choosing kings. That's not mentioned. Secondly, he leaves Saul almost out altogether. He only records Saul's death. That's because he wants them to see kings in a good light. So most of Saul's reign is just not there. However, David... There's an awful lot there, but what is missed out? All his struggles with Saul, missed out. His seven-year reign in Hebron is missed out. His many wives are missed out. Absalom's rebellion is missed out. 
And above all, the whole episode with Bathsheba that was the turning point in David's reign is not there. Now this is all very significant. The man is deliberately playing up the kings. If he can say something good about them, he does. If he can't, he doesn't. And uh, even with those he says good things about, if there are bad things, he misses them out. Fancy missing out David and Bathsheba, which was such a turning point. But it's not there. David here appears in a wonderful light. So does Solomon. There's not a word here about his many wives or the idols that were brought into the palace. His faulty relationship with God is not mentioned. His failure to deal with the high places, the pagan temples, not mentioned. And then when we get to the divided kingdom, nothing about the kings in the north, because they were all bad. And when we come to the kings of the south, we find that he really gives a lot of um, space to the good kings, like the boy king Josiah and king Hezekiah, but uh, the bad kings, hardly there at all. Now the man is not prejudiced, he's doing it quite deliberately. He has certain interests, there are common threads that run right through, that were not prominent in Saul's reign, but were in David and Solomon's and some of the kings of Judah. First of all, he is only concerned with the royal line of David. Only concerned with kings that are in that royal line. Since none of the kings of the north were, they don't belong. This is a history of the royal house of David and no one else. Saul is not in it because he wasn't in the royal line of David. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. Northern kings are not in it. But one man who is in this book, who's not in those, is a man called Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel was the royal line of David who came back from Babylon exile. And it was in him that their hopes for the Messiah lay. Because he was the only one who came back from David's line, Zerubbabel. And so he spends, when he goes through the genealogy, there's half a chapter on Zerubbabel's family tree, which is something quite new. He is not idolizing royalty, but he is what I would call idealizing royalty, painting it in a very favorable light. He doesn't highlight their differences, or rather their weaknesses. Now, is there a particular aspect of these good kings' reign that he concentrates on? Yes, there is. He is concerned with their attitude to two things, the ark and the temple. And he concentrates entirely on what they did about the ark of the covenant and a temple to house it as the place where God could live among his people. And all that it says about David is how he brought the ark to Jerusalem, his desire to build a temple, his preparation for it, gathering the materials, drawing the plans, how he arranged the services of worship and the choirs and the choir masters. All this is in great detail in Chronicles, and yet it's almost skipped over in the book of Kings and Samuel. So he's got a real interest in the place of worship. And Solomon, of course, pretty well all he tells us about him is how he built the temple that his father David couldn't and how he prayed at the end when it was dedicated and how the glory of the Lord came all about that underground quarry. You remember the no sound of hammer or chisel was heard because he was quarrying it underneath a hill in the cave? That's in Chronicles. It's not in Kings, actually. It's all over here. And these kings, in the writer's eyes, were good because they helped to keep the worship of the temple going. Well, now a priest would say that, wouldn't he? A prophet would concentrate... You see, a prophet would concentrate on the bad things they did that got the land into trouble. But the priest says, he built a temple for us. He got the choirs organized. He got the worship. And David was known to them as the man who was the worship leader and the psalm writer and the man who wanted the temple built and so on. So we've got David and Solomon and almost everything we're told about is what they did about the temple. When we pass on from Solomon and there is the great civil war and the ten tribes in the north split from the two tribes in the south, he's only interested in the south because that's where the temple is. That's where the priests of God are and that's where the royal line is kept. So he's staying with this interest and he picks out really only eight good kings, five of them outstandingly good. And uh, the twelve bad kings in the south he ignores. 
So again, you can see his mind, can't you, ticking. And he picks out Asa, and King Asa put away the idols in Judah and Benjamin, and removed his queen mother from the palace because she was secretly worshipping an idol in her bedroom. And Asa made a covenant with the Lord, and he enriched the temple with silver and gold. So in a priest's eyes, he's a good man. Got it? Then Jehoshaphat, who was Asa's son, he sent the Levites throughout Judah, teaching in every city, teaching them the law of God. And he got victory over Ammon and Moab when he said, the battle is not yours but God's, and he sent the singers into battle. But I'm afraid he did something bad. He married Ahab's daughter. And in fact, through that alliance, a terrible thing happened. Jezebel's daughter, Ataliah, came south and made a bid for the throne and killed all the royal seed of David, all the princes. She murdered. She wanted the throne. But that's when a priest, notice that, a priest Jehoiada kidnapped the youngest prince, Joash, and hid him and produced him later. Said, this is your rightful king. And Ataliah got her comeuppance. But uh, you see, once again, there's a priest who played a crucial part in preserving the royal line of David. You don't read about that in the other. Then Joash, he repaired the temple. And uh, he did good things. And then Hezekiah, we know about. He reopened and repaired the temple. And they celebrated a Passover with great joy and his reforms, which only have a few verses in Kings. There are three chapters about him over here. Because he reformed the worship and put the temple right. And then Josiah, he talks about him a lot, that boy king who again sprinkling in the temple, found the book of the law and put, in, uh, put back into the temple all the proper services and the feasts that they should have been observing. Now all these kings opposed idolatry. That's why in the priest's eyes they were good. And the interesting thing is this, idolatry was one of the things that bad kings got into, that the prophets denounced. But when the Jews came back from exile, they never again got into idolatry, and they haven't to this very day. They learned their lesson in the exile, and never again has a Jew worshipped an idol in the last 2,500 years. Interesting. And of course the priest was thrilled to bits with that. Because whereas the prophets tended to concentrate on immorality and injustice, the priests were most worried about idolatry. Now all this is telling us something. The book ends, actually, Chronicles ends, with Cyrus the Persian overcoming the Babylonians and sending the Jews back to their land to rebuild the temple. Now I want you to bear in mind that the people for whom this person is writing are the people coming back from exile who've been born in a foreign land, who've never seen the, a Jewish temple, and who aren't ruled over by a Prince of David. And what he's doing is to tell them three things. I call them the three R's. He wants to give them roots, royalty and religion again. The first thing they need to know as they come back to their own land is who they are. They need to know their identity. Let's uh, move on. I'm over here now. The returning exiles first of all needed to know who they were, that they had roots. And those roots went far back into history, right back to Adam. But he had to re-educate them all over again and take them right through from Adam, right through to where they are now. If you've read Alex Haley's books, Roots, or seen the film, that's a fascinating story about a, how a black man in America wanted to find out where he came from, who he was, and how he found his way right back to a river in, East, in West Africa where a young boy called Kunta Kinte had been kidnapped and sold as a slave to America. And he found his roots and went back to the village 
and found people there, still there, who, to whom he was related. And he suddenly felt, I know who I am. I know where I've come from. I know where I belong, where I fit into history. Now, the Jews needed this when they came back. They needed roots going right back. They needed to know that they had a line that God had been controlling all the way down, that they belonged to God and that he'd singled them out from the whole human race and selected Abraham and, and so on. And that's why Chronicles went right back to the very beginning. They needed roots. They needed identity, a rooted people. The second thing they needed was to know that they were a royal people and that they had their own king and they had their own royal land, the line. They were going back to the land and he wanted them to start thinking about the king again to restore the kingdom of Israel. So they were going to need leadership and he's telling them you're not just a group of people, misfits, you are a royal priesthood, you are a royal people, you have a king and the royal line has been preserved and you're going to be a kingdom again. And the third thing that he wanted to convey to them is not just their identity and not just the matter of leadership but the purpose for which they existed as a people and that purpose was religious. The most important thing that made them what they were was the fact that they were God's chosen people and that their worship of God was absolutely central to their identity as a people. And so when they went back, the first priority was to get a temple built and to get worship re-established. It's interesting that of those who went back, nearly over 10% of those who went back were priests, which is a far higher proportion than the number of priests in the whole people. So why did more priests than anybody else go back from Babylon, the end of the exile? The answer was they had the right reason for going back. Many of the others had settled down, got businesses going and prospered, were very comfortable. But the priests had no temple. And they wanted to get back to re-establish the worship of God, to get the temple up. So more priests, when uh, Zerubbabel called for volunteers to offer to trek across the Arabian desert and go back to that land that they'd never seen and build a temple, it was the priests who said, we'll go. And out of all proportion to their numbers, the priests led the way back. And their leader was a man called Joshua. Well, now you can see these three purposes of Chronicles very clearly. You are a rooted people. You have a history. You belong. This is your family tree. It's a very special family tree. And you are a royal people. You're a kingdom. And you're going to have a king. In fact, you've got one. We've preserved the royal line. And Zerubbabel is the prince. And you are a religious people. And you need to get back to worship. That is the most important reason for going back. And therefore the first thing you must get built is a temple where you can praise God because that's the reason you're called a Jew. Jew means praise God. And that's the whole reason for you going back there to establish God's name in his city again. So the book was, if you like, a sermon for that returning remnant. And we know they were very discouraged when they went back. It wasn't a very exciting business. They had to struggle to make a living. They were very poor. They were very slow building the temple. It needed two prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, just to keep them going. But we'll see that when we study those books. But he had to get this instilled into them. God must come first in your life as a people. That's why we're going back. We're going back to be God's people, not just to have a home of our own. Alas, Israel today is largely there because they wanted a home of their own where they could be safe. They did not really go back to establish themselves as God's people. Never forget three quarters of an hour I had with the president of Israel in his palace. And at the end of the talk he said, well, I'm an agnostic. I don't really believe in God. This was President Navon of Israel. And I said, but this is the land where God did his greatest miracles. He said, well, I can't believe it. I was sad. You see, it was so important that they went back as a religious people, as God's people. 
and that the temple should be the very centre of their return and the very centre of their hopes. That's why he wrote it. And you can see the message is quite different from the prophetic message. This is what happened to get you into this mess. It's too late now to say all that. They're in the mess. Now he's wanting to lift them up and say, let's go back and start again. And so he inspires them with this, these wonderful stories of the past. Let me just quickly bring the threads together. Christ himself picked up all these threads in himself. That's why Matthew begins with the genealogy of Christ. In fact, Luke takes it right back to Adam. It's almost as if you hear the genealogy all over again. Because Christ had roots. Christ was and is a Jew. He's still a Jew. And it's important that we know that he was not a rootless person. He came from these roots. Furthermore, he was the fulfillment of their royal line. He was the son of David. And he could inherit that throne twice over. Through his father he had a legal right to it and through his mother a physical right to it. Because they both came from the line of David. And uh, he was also the fulfillment of their religious hopes, the temple, because he actually became the temple. It says, the word was made flesh and tabernacled among us. He said, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. He saw himself as the focus of their worship. So these three things you see coming together in Christ. I haven't time to show how it all comes together in Christ. But now these three things are passed on to us. And we inherit the three R's because we have been grafted into Jewish roots so their genealogy is ours. When I read Chronicles 1 to 9, I'm reading my family tree because I'm now a son of Abraham. I've been grafted into their roots. Their roots are mine. These are my forefathers. And when you're a Christian, your true roots are now Jewish. They're even more significant to you than your family tree physically. Because that family tree will disappear at death. But it's the Jewish family tree that is now your genealogy. In Christ, you inherit the blessings of Abraham. You're part of this. You're now a rooted people, but your roots are Jewish. The olive tree is Jewish. And we are now royal people. We are a royal priesthood. You are princes and princesses. You should walk down the street like a prince or like a princess. I've said that to many hangdog Christians whose heads were down. And I've said, lift your head up. You're a prince. You're a princess. Behave like one. There are too many others not behaving like one. You behave like them. We are the royal family and we're going to reign over this world with Christ. It says he has redeemed from every kindred and tribe and tongue men for God and they shall reign on the earth. We're going to reign. We are the royal family of England and we should behave that way. It puts a responsibility on us. But you've got royal blood in you now. It's the blood of Jesus. And we have become the temple. Don't you know your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit? Don't you know that you corporately in the church are the temple of God wherein he dwells? So that these three things which the people returning from the exile needed to be taught, we need to claim because they are ours. We are a rooted people, a royal people, and a religious people. We're the temple of God. And yet there is a difference. We are still in exile. We haven't come home yet. We're strangers and pilgrims in a foreign land. Though you may say, but I'm English and I live in England or whatever, you really, you don't belong here. Your citizenship is in heaven and you're a stranger and people will regard you as that. You, somehow you're a misfit. Brother, they think gypsies are misfits. I tell you, the world thinks every Christian is. And Jesus said, they hated me, so they're likely to hate you. We don't belong. It's amazing how quickly your friends drop you. Somebody once asked the great Baptist preacher, C.H. Spurgeon, it was a girl, and she'd just been converted, and she said, uh, how many of my old friends should I give up now? He said, don't bother. He said, they'll give you up quick enough. <laughs> See, and I'm afraid that is true. And you find yourself more closely related to people who are not your physical relatives, but who are your spiritual family, don't you? 
You've got to work hard to keep your relationships with your unbelieving relatives because now you belong to a new family, royal family, and you're the temple of God. What you do with your body, you're doing with the temple of God. It's one reason why I've noticed so many people give up smoking when they become Christians. Now there's nothing in the Bible against smoking and it won't take you to hell. It only makes you smell as if you've already been there. But <laughs> Suddenly, I've known, I've known Christian men say, what am I doing to the temple of God? I'm making it smell, I'm making it dirty, and I'm shortening its life. They give it up. When you see your body as the temple of God, get a different idea about it. See? So uh, we are now inheriting the teaching of Chronicles. And I hope that's helped to make it not just a dull old bit of history, but made it a different book. It's got quite a different message to Kings, quite a different message. And a message of hope for the future and what we're here for, why we're here, and how to find our true identity as the people of God in a strange land. Well, let's read that book in a new way and get some new lessons from it. <laughs>